man thinks that by mouthing hard words, he understands hard things. Herman Melville. Chapter 1. Somewhere out to nowhere specific. <clears throat> Overcast skies hung over the Pacific. Fucking hate, think I, for this isn't exactly the situation I like to be in. There's only balls of six now left of my shift. It's the middle of the night, and the moon's been coming and going, coming and going, dodging in and out of clouds. Some entity upstairs seems to think it's funny flick around with a celestial light switch. But all it's been doing is pissing all us squids off here on the flight deck of the USS James Earl Jimmy Carter. Coming and going, coming and going, coming and going, as she damn well pleases. Oh, don't be like that. Come on, sweetie. Stick around. Stick around with that brilliant smile of yours so we can see. But then all of a sudden, she disappears completely. Fucking A, thank I again, for this is now definitely not the situation I like to be in. As me and the airframe I'm with, AM3 turnip seed, are left sitting blinder than a clam you'd find at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. Damn, damn. I guess I shouldn't have called her sweetie. It seems as if though Madame Luna up there don't like me much anymore. She probably thought I was coming on to her considering all the attention I was giving. But all I really wanted was just some friendly company. That's all, that's all. But it's too late now for the bitch won't come out. She probably took me for the stereotypical sailor based on our reputation. And so, I mean, so what if most of us are partial to whoring up many questionable women with each port we hit? And so, what if I was sort of coming on to you either? I gotta say, you were looking pretty damn sexy and available up there, madam, might I add. So what if I did get turned on a little? All that really makes me out to be here is a flesh and blood human being, damn it. So what's wrong with that? Fuck this nonsense, I can't see shit, says AM3 turnip seat. I know, I know, say I. Where'd that bitch go, damn it, like every other woman in my life, concludes the airframer. That throws me off a little as I turn my head around to ID AM3. Or really, I try to, for I can't see, for it's still too dark. I am, with my mouth all twisted up like a question mark, intrigued by the AM3's words. Funny. Seems as if though turnip seat here would be thinking along the same lines as me. And I just thought I was solely the one dabbling in absurdities, imagining the moon as the sort of woman that wouldn't give me the time of day. Fucking A, fuck the moon, fuck that bitch, and fuck it's cold, blast turnip seat. And now I'm reminded of how I'm also freezing my nuts off up here as well. Up here, up top here on the flight deck, out in the open of the open seas, chilling winds truly are a force to be reckoned with. Like a giant army of warmongering marauders, they'll come and go, racing across the ocean's surface. A giant army of legendary old, led by the likes of Genghis Khan's ghost, riding through space and time. The winds will come a-rumbling and a-roaring, and we will hear them coming from a very far distance. A-rumbling and a-roaring and a-thundering and a-clashing they'll go. Ah, shit, I feel a big one coming on. Louder, louder, louder. Oh, fuck me, this is gonna be bad. Then whoosh, we feel as they cross paths. Ah, shit, fuck, it's cold. The last gush of wind practically went straight for my bones. Blast turnip seed. Fucking hell, shit. It went straight for my motherfucking soul. Fuck this, I'm out of here. Blast the shit out of eyes. I chatter the fuck out of my teeth. Chattering them hard as they feel to shatter. And am then left tasting the blood and shards. I think I'll go down to get me another jacket. Whisper I at the end while shivering all over. But then as I get up off the tow bar I and turnip seed were sitting on. I remember how. Ah, shit. I still can't see nada. And cringe a little inside. Well, good luck with that. I think I'll just sit here a little while longer. Bring me one too, if you can. Request turnip seed. And that pisses me off a little to hear. Hell, you're no lime rat. I bet your shop is full of nice warm jackets with woolen inner lining. Well, all we're getting is this cheap plastic shit that has holes in them. And for some reason are always wet. Don't be a lazy ass and go get your own from your own damn shop, you damn airframer. I go as I scold the airframer I'm with, with thoughts only faintly disclosed by my eyes. I then turn around to begin making my way back to my shop, while tripping over and bumping into everything standing in between, feet stepping over uneven surface, feeling the non-skids of the deck, also objects sticking out where they shouldn't. Where's my night vision? Think I as I strain my eyes to see if I can help speed up the dilation process, and then peer all about to see whether or not I have. But all I can make out still at the moment are the contours of blackened, unidentifiable objects over more blackened, unidentifiable objects. Only objects I can make out are the dim orange lights coming from the ship's island behind me, a good distance away. 
which are barely able to shine light on the crap that's around them, let alone enough to shine light on the crap that's around me, making me wonder why they even have them on. Yet still, I try to improvise using them as a marker to get a sense of direction, as I take small steady steps forward into the nothing. Then peering back to those lights, I calculate the relative distance I've made, and from there I map out by memory what I should be expecting in the vicinity. Having to work at night on night check, up here I need to have that sense about me, so I don't end up plowing face first into a jet, or worse, walking straight off the side of the freaking ship. Hell, if it came to that, seeing how dark it is up here, no one would probably notice that a man has gone overboard. And all I would have then is this stupid beacon light to get the boat's attention as it continued sailing off without me. Hold on there, how do I use this light again? I know it's supposed to stick to my cranial and bang. And with the next step I take, I smack cranial first into the nose of one of our F-14 Tomcats. The fuck I doing? Pay attention to where you're stepping, Navashin. I scold myself then turn to look back at the light from the island, then figure, good, this must be 104. The shop should be just below. Whoosh goes Attila the Hun's ghost riding on high with another army of freezing winds. Fuck you, Attila, fuck you. You're a bitch compared to Genghis and his Mongols. I wasn't impressed. <sighs> I sigh, I sigh as I reach the steps, while crouching under the stab of the warbird, and then begin making my way down below. I step into the rat ways, take off my cranial by the latch, and throw it over my shoulder. I then go through a hatch leading into the shop, and finally I am inside, and I am safe. For the few moments I now have to reach the shop, hunt down another jacket, and then set myself back out again into the wild, and back to my lawful duties, I am safe. Such evanescent movements are now set before me, for it should only take two to five minutes to accomplish all that in a reasonable amount of time. A reasonable amount of time, wonder I, as I now find myself staring at a dim light overhead at attached to the bulkhead, and begin to feel a bit pleasantly lethargic. I then find myself wondering, what's the rush? <sighs> Since the time I've spent in, I've been asked by many of my old civvy friends the question, that question, the question of how serving in the Navy is like. I see them then and how their eyes bulge open wide as they begin filling their heads with wonders after I've told them stories of being stationed in Japan, then how we'd be having to spend months and months on end sailing aboard a ship, hitting ports such as Hong Kong and Singapore and Australia and Thailand, and many other assortments of places. I see them, and I see the places their minds go as I tell them all about it. I see how they see me at those places, who I am there and then and then back again. I see them seeing that and that person. But the one thing they don't see that I also notice, never once do they really see me, see me now, see me this. I highlighted with somber tones, with a touch of something gloomy and melancholic, standing before a flimsy light amongst the dark. A pitiful light that can barely hold its own, only capable of illuminating so much as the rest of the passageway falls gradually into darkness. The one thing that no non-serviceman ever sees is this, ever. Standing before a dim faded light while basking in its warmth and completely feeling one in content with the experience. However little that warmth might be, to really best to explain it, it is best to understand the concept behind hurry up and wait. For right now, this moment is truly what it's like to serve in a navy aboard this ship somewhere out in the Pacific, treading waters out to nowhere specific. Hurry up and wait, say I to myself. And I then find myself standing here a good five minutes, probably far more than the time it would have taken me to get to the shop, hunt down that jacket, and then back out again, back to freezing my nuts off some more, freezing them off for Her Majesty's service. <laughs> Wait, Her Majesty's service? The fuck I thinking? I then try to distinguish the difference between the Royal British Navy and the service I am in, then grow a bit curious over how much difference that service would be in comparison to mine. Well, the time is now balls something. I have no watch, so I can't tell. I'm sure around zero two hundred hours, let's say, it would have it would have been time to head down to the shop for some crumpets and tea, which in the Royal British Navy would be a mandatory affair, punishable by gagging for anyone who'd refuse. Now that would have been delightful. Definitely something awfully fucking gay, fucking awfully. Another five minutes now feels like it has also passed as I find myself still standing here staring at the bulkhead light, 
which begins to take on peculiar properties. You know, my Uncle Sean once told me, I'll tell you, life is like a favorite song coming on the radio, but unlike any other song, this one, for whatever reason, whenever you hear the song, you're never once able to catch the lyrics. Then one day a tragedy hits, or a blessing, either one, it doesn't matter, since it's just supposed to be a moment that's fated to become monumental for you in life. All of a sudden, that moment, the song finds a way of playing again, either around you or in your head. And at that moment, that very moment, it's only then you finally find yourself hearing the song for its lyrics, and finally, realizing what it all meant. Hurry up and wait, I say to myself again, and now beginning to understand what it means to be a moth before a flame. Two minutes now. All right, if I keep this up, if I keep this up, someone is surely bound to pass by within that time. A khaki, most definitely. And I really don't feel like an ass chewing right about now. But then again, and now ten minutes. Fine, I'll admit, this isn't exactly what hurry up and wait is supposed to be about. What I'm doing right now is what you could call hurry up and skate, which is something that is also heavily practiced throughout the fleet, greatly more so if you, if you were to ask me. Both involving waiting around all brain dead while collecting barnacles on your backside, except the difference now being none of my superiors would know about it. With skating, I'm doing it while out of sight and out of mind. Truly hurry up and wait. It's all about mustering up information and then waiting an indefinite amount of time for our LPOs or LCPOs to stop pacing up and down before us and think up of something for us to do. Pacing up and down, scratching their heads and picking their noses while we stand at attention for what feels like hours upon hours upon hours on end. But we'll hurry up and skate. It's practically the same thing. Our superiors will still be pacing up and down, scratching their asses and, and pinching their creases while wondering out loud if they should have used more starch on them. Aye. That's definitely a Navy thing. You'll notice a lot of Joe Navy lifers tend to do. But anyways, once they'd be done with all that, this time around, once they came up with a detail, they'd turn around and gasp at the sight of an empty room, seeing as to how we're all gone, hightailed it out of there, disappeared, ditched the freaking joint. So all in all, the only difference being, instead of giving them the pleasure of wasting our time, <clears throat> we're now giving ourselves the pleasure of wasting our own. Personally, I like to imagine them becoming all hop and mad when they've noticed how we've all vanished like a fart in the wind as they're forced to run around looking for us up to the flight deck, down to the hangar bay, back and forth, back and forth, all throughout the freaking ship. <laughs> I laugh, and at the sight of picturing all that in my head, <laughs> and within the very next second, I sense the hash behind me turning, ah, shit, which breaks me out of my reverie and brings me center. Shit, is it khaki? I worry, then disperse from the light as I throw myself into motion, heading for the shop. Don't look back, Navashian, if it's khaki. The stupid WTF look on my face would only constitute to them how I wasn't doing what I should be doing, constituting for them to then get involved. 